you've got to know which metrics and which needles are you trying to move. One of the biggest mistakes is they spray and pray, as they say. They'll throw out a lot of marketing money. Hey, I'm doing my Google ads. I'm doing my Facebook, my Instagram, my TikTok. I'm doing all this stuff, but my production's still the exact same. Well, are you doing all that stuff targeting the right patient, targeting the right community? Have you run an analysis on your existing patients, on your existing demographics surrounding the practice? And is there alignment there? Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Raving Patients Podcast. As you know, I'm your host, Dr. Len Tao, and I want to thank everybody for joining me for this episode. I also want to thank the sponsors, both Dental Intelligence and the Doc Sites, for their continued support, allowing me to come to your inbox every single Friday at 5 a.m. Eastern Standard Time with a new episode released. And I also want to remind everybody about my event, Supercharge Your Dental Practice. It is coming back to Florida in 2025, September 26th and 27th to be exact. It's at the Pier 66 Resort, which is a brand new resort. It still isn't technically open yet. It should open in the beginning of the year. So it's a brand new resort, five miles from Fort Lauderdale Airport. So it's a very convenient place to get to. We're going to have some, we're going to have 12 to 13 amazing speakers that I'm excited to start announcing very shortly. So my guest today is Jake Goats from Goat Marketing Consultants. So Jake and I are going to discuss many things related to how to convert these patients into paying patients. Jake has been selling, marketing, and training sales and marketing people on proven strategies for over 20 years. After more than a decade working in the dental industry, Jake founded Goat Dental Marketing Consultants, designed to provide expert marketing and sales strategy support to private practices who couldn't afford an in-house marketing director. They train dentists on the business side of things, what to look for, when to pivot, how to adapt and delegate, and what to pay attention to or ignore. So please welcome to the Raving Patients Podcast, Jake Goats. Jake, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Len. It's it's fun to be on here finally. Yeah, we've been talking about it for a long time. Yeah, we have. So it's fun to finally get a chance to share some insights and learn from your group as well. So why don't you begin with, why don't you tell people, I know I read your bio, why don't you tell people what you do and how you help dental practices? Yeah. So uh, about 13, oh, 12 years ago now, uh, I got into dental after uh, I graduated in professional sales. And then after selling a bunch of stuff, I realized maybe marketing uh, can get even better with a salesman's perspective. So I got into marketing. And as I've gotten into it, uh, after about 10 years of working for different large uh, direct mail campaign agencies and digital agencies in the dental space, I specifically uh, got into consulting. And uh, it was funny, I, I had a client who actually told me, hey, why don't you come and hold all of my other marketers accountable? And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, I don't know what questions to ask them, and I don't know if they're doing a good job. At the time, I was only doing one small thing for his social media and so uh, that kind of evolved into uh, creating my own consultancy as a fractional chief marketing officer. And really all I had done was created a glorified job at that point. Um, and as I onboarded you know, more and more clients uh, and transitioned away from working full-time in an agency uh, mm -hmm. and running my own thing, I decided, well, I'm going to need a lot of other people because naturally you just start getting more and more questions about the business and how to grow the business. And there were things that I knew I wasn't good at, uh, you know, like answering the financial questions and how to pivot the bigger picture of the business. And so that was when we started evolving a little bit and expanding our offering from just helping with their marketing strategy to now we've got different consultants that focus on people and leadership skills, uh, systems, operations, patient experience, uh, and then a lot of my own homegrown team are still doing a lot of the the marketing strategies. So uh, we, you know, they say it takes a village as they joke about being a parent. It takes a village to raise your kids. Uh, I agree that it takes a village to grow a business. And uh, it's all about finding the right people who know how to collaborate together and work together and, and share and know what to do with the data. So that's kind of what we've come to deliver at GoatCMO.com. And it's been a really fun ride. Got it. No, that makes a lot of sense. So let's start jumping into the, some of the content we wanted to talk about. And something that I am a, a big proponent of or a fan of um, is obviously uh, being a dentist and a vendor, I know both sides of the 
the spectrum. Okay. And one of the things that I always hear about is my marketing company isn't generating new patients for me. Okay. So I, I know one of the things we want to talk about a low new patient count is likely not your marketer's fault. And obviously the goal of a marketing company is to generate leads for a practice. Okay. The rest is up to the practice. Okay. You know, we, we, you get them to the door, the phone, and the rest is up to the practice. And a lot of times there are a lot of things that just isn't synced up properly. There is not somebody who doesn't answer the phone properly. I just did a, a podcast episode uh, with Susan Lekowitz and she's talking about crushing the, the, the phone, you know, crush the call. And there's so many practices who ha- horribly handle the phone. Um, they have the least trained employee on there. Um, and, and that's where the first impression is made when someone first calls the office. So can you talk about why you're feeling that a low new patient count may not be your mark, a marketer's fault? Yeah, I think it's a very big misconception in dental specifically. Uh, I've seen it in a, in a few other industries, but really a lot of people believe that marketing equals new patients. And that's just not true. Um, marketing equals leads and then lead management equals new patients. And how you manage those leads uh, really matters. How you answer the phone, if you answer the phone, uh, you know, 33% of all phone calls go missed at the front desk. And, you know, I've had clients who say, no, I disagree with you. Come on in. You'll see it's not our front desk. It's not the calls that are the problem. Uh, It's our marketing team. And we'll get in and realize, oh, you're actually missing 60% of your new phone calls. And they're just shocked when we plug in different tools to track that Um, because they thought while they were back in the back taking care of patients that everything was going uh, the right way up front. And so, that's what I mean by it is that marketing is actually the easy part, uh, typically speaking, making your phone ring, putting yourself out there, making yourself visible on Google, on social media, sending out postcards so that people see it and search you and your increased online traffic search happens. There is a lot to be said for your marketing efforts and what is converting that traffic into action of actually calling the practice or submitting a lead form. But a uh, prime example, and I use this one a lot, one of the very first doctors that ever reached out to me, I had worked with him for seven years, and he said that he wanted me to come over, and he was the reason that I started GoatCMO.com, but he was in Denver, very, very competitive market, a lot of DSO money, a lot of online spending going on, and he said, no, I, I know that it's my marketing company that's failing, and he was using one company for digital and a different company for a bunch of other stuff. Well, we got in and looked at it. He actually, the month that he hired us to come in, he had 116 new leads. And he had just told me he had his worst new patient flow ever. And that he only saw 40 new patients that month. And I got in and looked at it. And of those 114 new patient leads, only 31 of them had actually been contacted. And I should say not contacted. 31 of them had been attempted to be contacted. Uh, only 19 of them had actually been contacted with a warm voice on the other end of the phone. And that was just his lead form submissions through his website and through his Google ads. So we got in and the very next month, we just worked with the front desk to teach them simple procedures to follow up with those leads and track their work. And just by putting a lead tracker form in place for the, to hold the team accountable, they went to 67 new patients the very next month and they only had 90 or 92, I think, new leads. So they had less leads, but had, uh, you know, 20 plus more new patients just by name. That's great. They had a much higher conversion then based on a small number of leads through just tweaking some things you did. And you mentioned you run through almost like a checklist of things they should be doing. Can you talk about some of those things that for practices can do when they get a lead? What are the things they should do to, to nurture that lead or, or reach out? Can you talk about that? That's the lead management part of it. So can you, can you talk about the lead management part of things? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is just at what are you currently doing to track and capture all of the leads. Uh, you know, some people, they just get a lead form submitted right through their website or through their landing page. And that information comes in an, in, in an email form. Um, a lot of practices are learning more since the pandemic. And since there's been this big injection of the adoption of technology and utilizing technology more, um, a lot of practices are finally learning about CRMs, the customer relationship management tools that are out there. 
And so having it where all of your leads are being generated in a form that puts them into a specific platform where you can see their name, their phone number, their email address, and then most importantly, having an ability to mark those leads as, you know, one that has been approached and contacted. Uh, the biggest thing that we know, statistically speaking, is the speed to contact, not the speed to attempt. Uh, I think there's a big mix up. And I noticed that with a lot of our new clients, they come on and they say, hey, we're reaching out to these patients the second that the email comes in. Well, what percentage of people nowadays answer an unknown caller? And so you might be, they might be calling them, but it goes to voicemail. They leave a voicemail and move on to the next one and they forget about it. And so having systems in place that allow you to keep track of what time did the lead come in, all their contact info, and setting yourself a reminder and a task to try again and try again until you get them on the phone um, is critical to your success. What do you find as the number of times you want to attempt to reach out before you kind of say, okay, they're not, they're not interested. They're not picking up when we're, we're just going to move on because obviously, you know, uh, you want to work smarter, not harder and continuing to reach out to these clients may be a waste of time after a while. So do you give a certain number of reach outs before you say, forget about it and move on? Um, yes and no. It's a loaded question because yes, I like to reach out. I call it the, we call it the goat method, um, you know, play on words, but the goat, the goat method of managing your leads for me is you dial immediately within five minutes of the lead coming in, you got to give them a phone call. So you dial first. If it goes to voicemail greeting, immediately hang up and send a text message within 30 seconds. If you send a text message saying, this is Jake at ABC Dental, we received your inquiry for more information, is now a good time to talk? Question mark. Wait 30 seconds. If they haven't texted you back, you call again. What that does is it shows their caller ID. It shows a text come in from that same caller ID. And then it shows a caller ID coming in a second time, all within a two-minute period. And if you do that, your answer rate will go through the roof on, on what percentage of people will actually answer that call or at least text you back saying, I can't talk right now. Thank you for reaching out. And then you can at least send them a link to book online if that's what you decide to do. But the double down method or the goat method, as we call it, is really a big, big play. Um, don't waste your time leaving a voicemail until you've sent a text but don't send a text first, I think it's a waste of time. You've missed an opportunity for that small percentage that will answer on the first call. And so that's something that I found to work very, very well. And our clients have noticed that it, it reduces the amount of follow-up calls that they have to make later, if you can do that in the first two minutes. And how often do you recommend doing that if they don't pick up before you say, okay, this is a lost lead, they're not interested? I usually say you want to have an approach like that over the course of the first seven days of the lead. If you can follow up with them every single day for seven days and then it's not there, then you can kick them straight into a drip campaign and let a drip campaign, such as an automated text going out or an automated program, uh, take it from there. But I'm a huge proponent of you leverage technology with the human element. Don't rely on technology completely. Uh, you have to have the human element behavioral uh, patterns lined in with what you're doing with your systems. Um, so that, that's a really big piece that I find just drives a lot higher success rate. Got it. No, that makes a lot of sense to me. So let's, uh, let's switch, shift gears a little bit. Let's talk about marketing budget. Um, there's always a the question was how much am I supposed to spend? How much should I spend? What is too much? What's too little? Um, obviously there are percentages of overhead that you want to put towards marketing. Um, on a side note, if you take insurance, I believe that insurance write-off should be a form of marketing. Nobody looks at it that way. They look at it as a write-off. Because you're taking the insurance plan to accept a 30 to 35% decrease in the fees you're getting, that fee should be put towards your marketing budget. Because that's the only reason you're getting those patients. So a lot of people don't think of it that way. I look at things a little bit differently there. So forget about that for a moment. What percentage of um, overhead do you think should be allocated towards marketing? What is the generally, the ROI that, you know, assuming it's a a well-managed, well-run campaign, what should be the ROI to be expected based on that spend as well? Yeah. So establishing your budget comes down to a couple of things. Uh, and there's a lot of variables to consider, but a good rule of thumb, if you're ready to grow, um, you need to be typically in that 6% plus range of your 
I look at annual collections. So whatever your average monthly collections have been, I like to be above 6% if you want to grow. Um, it takes a lot to convince me to go above 9%. Uh, I, I'm a little bit more conservative that way. A lot of DSOs that are going really heavy acquiring practices that are going after a lot of fixed full arch stuff. They're saying, you know, you got to be upwards of 13 to 15%. I read an article the other day that I wanted to just shout from the rooftops. This person's insane, but she was saying 15 to 25% uh, is what dentists need to be spending. And I just thought, I hate that she had, this person has such a loud voice because it's going to influence some of those that are a little bit less knowledgeable and they're going to get into some trouble if they're spending that much money. But uh, traditionally speaking, if you want to retain your current status quo, let's say you're in a good place, things are going well, you should still be allocating between two and 4% of your collections to some form of marketing to maintain that. Uh, but growth mode, I like to be in the six to 9% range. Um, so, you know, keep the math easy. If you're at a million dollar practice, 60,000 bucks a, um, a year, 5,000 bucks a month that you're allocating, uh, the number one thing, and I know you appreciate this, but you got to make sure you never turn off your marketing tool. That's helping you get Google reviews. Uh, it's just going to optimize your click through rates and your success overall dramatically. And so I always tell people never turn off something like, you know, your whatever your automated system is that's sending out your Google invite to give you a Google review after every patient comes in. Yeah, I'm a, I'm obviously a big advocate of that. And I think the opposite as well. I want you to stop your marketing spend until you have a steady flow of reviews because you're wasting your money. If you don't have a steady flow of reviews coming in, you don't have the credibility that the, that's going to convert the patients that you're particularly reaching out to or reaching when the marketing is hitting them. They're going to look you up online and decide, hey, this guy has no reviews and no recent reviews. I'm not coming in. So you should not be spending your money on marketing unless you're generating reviews at the same time. Yes. It's always part of that, uh, that 6% that I build out as a starting point. Um, if they want to get more aggressive, then I'll scale that up, maybe hit it really, really hard. Uh, some people like to go and, and double down on their money up front of marketing, and then they scale it back to something that's sustainable. Uh, that's one strategy out the, out the door, especially if you're doing like a grand opening or maybe it's a scratch practice. People always say, well, I don't know what my numbers are. Um, well, what do you want your numbers to be? And what is that scalability model? Um, I, I was super excited the other day. I got off the call with a new doctor and his wife. They just graduated dental school two years ago, decided they're going to go out on their own. And they had established their budget for the first year specifically for marketing. And they had put in all of their goals. They had one of the most robust spreadsheets I'd seen any new doctor build. And they purposefully are taking out additional financing as part of their construction loan to dedicate to their marketing. And I was super proud of them because they said, we want to be at $800,000 by the end of year one. And we specifically uh, have allocated this much money every month to make that happen. Um, I was, I had this first time in 12 years working in dental that I had seen somebody do that. So uh, scientifically and projecting that, and so, you know, I, I just tip my hat to those who are looking at those things and keeping those things in consideration, because you, if you don't invest in it and you just look at it as a, as a spend and not as an investment with an ROI, then you're struggling and, and you're looking at it the wrong way. So average ROI, you asked that question as well. You should not be uh, putting a lot of money into something if you're not projecting at least a two to four X ROI out the gate. Um, does that mean you're always going to get it? No. Uh, it's, there are times that it's acceptable to have a one X ROI and, and just break even, or even treat it as a loss leader. That's going to generate more exposure, more brand awareness, get you Google reviews, get you referrals. And so having a very good, uh, well-rounded strategy, of both internal campaigns and referrals, as well as, you know, ground marketing that you're doing with the boots on the ground and kind of bootstrapping it, as well as things you're investing in for digital marketing, postcards, you know, magazines, TV, radio, depending on how big you want to go, all of that should be taken into account. 
Um, if you're hiring a consultant like my team, I always budget our fee into whatever that marketing budget is so that it's not above and beyond. Uh, if I can't justify my own fee as part of a marketing budget, then it's not a good fit and we won't bring somebody on. Got it. Got it. So I think um, another question that I get a lot of is, and I, all the time actually is, how do, and I ask the question, you know, do you think your marketing is working for you? And a lot of times they say, I don't know, or they don't think so. So what is the best way to really know, or how do they know if their marketing is working for them? Because that's an important thing. They're spending an upwards of could be $5,000 a month on marketing. And if it's not working, you need to stop it. So um, how does someone know if their marketing is, is, is or is not working for them? You've got to know which metrics and which needles are you trying to move? You know, I think one of the biggest mistakes is they, they spray and pray, as they say. You know, they'll throw out a lot of marketing money. They'll, they'll hey, I'm doing my Google ads. I'm doing my Facebook, my Instagram, my TikTok. I'm, I'm doing all this stuff, but my production's still the exact same. Well, are you doing all that stuff targeting the right patient? targeting the right community? Are you, you know, have you run an analysis uh, on your existing patients, on your existing demographics surrounding the practice? And is there alignment there? Um, you know, oftentimes I'll, I'll meet with somebody where they'll say, oh, but I just went in and I updated and I retyped all of the, all my service pages and now they're way better service pages and I'm still not getting any more traffic. And it's like, well, did you work on your website content for one of one or the other reason because there's only two reasons you change your website you either change your website to improve your seo to drive more traffic to it or you improve your website and your verbiage to improve conversion rates so is what you are about to do designed to improve traffic or designed to improve conversion and if you know what those metrics are that you're trying to move and trying to adjust then you know that you can look at the right thing and see, did those things I just invested in increase my number of web page visitors? Or did it increase my number of actual new patients in the chair? So that's what you need to look at. Is a marketing campaign for a direct mail postcard designed to drive more website traffic, more people into reading your Google reviews? What link are you putting on your postcard? What QR code are you pointing them to? Is it to your online scheduling tool? Did that increase your number of new patients? So I think that's a big thing that you need to ask yourself before you just dump money into it. So what are the metrics so that I can know, did I move the needle and was that the needle I needed to move? Got it. Um, and then last question I know we wanted to cover was how to handle cause and objection handling. So obviously there's so many different reasons why someone gives you objections to whether they don't want to schedule. They're too busy once they get in the office. So, um, you know, there's objections to paying for things or they have to talk to their spouse. So can you talk about some of the, the call handling and objection handling as well? Yeah, it's my favorite part because I, I, like I said at the beginning, I, I studied professional selling. I sold everything from door to door selling Jesus as a missionary all the way through, uh, you know, doing now marketing services uh, and Sales is a very fun game for me. Uh, it's all about relationships. In fact, I'm I'm reading this book again. It's called Sales Tough. Uh, it's a great book that I highly recommend for people who just need the fundamental basics of mindset. But answering the phones, there's key fundamentals. You don't want to make it sound like a robot. You want to address the practice. You want to address your, and introduce yourself so that the person calling knows they called the right place. And it gives you a reason to ask them for their name. You know, hey, this is Jake with ABC Dental. How can I help you today? Oh, this is my question. Great. What was your name? You ask for their name and you use their name throughout. That builds rapport. That builds relationships. Um, and then the objection that I think is the funniest one is when people say, I just got this this morning in an email. A doctor said, uh, our problem is that all of our none of our leads want to schedule an appointment. I wrote back, I said, what do you mean they don't want to schedule an appointment? Why on earth did they click their your link? Why did they Google search the keyword? You know, they were, this doctor was really concerned about all these new leads that have come in. They got six of them yesterday and they said not one of them wanted to schedule. And I said, what do you mean they don't want to schedule? They wouldn't have searched dentists near me 
clicked on your link and called your office or submitted their information if they didn't want something. So I went and I listened to two of those phone calls and I was like, oh my gosh, they're just missing the boat. They're literally, their front office gal was just calling and saying, I'm sorry, do you, uh, let me just ask you, do you have insurance? Oh no, I have Medicaid. Oh, I'm sorry, we don't accept Medicaid, goodbye. There wasn't even an, an effort put in to ask them, well, you know, what was happening when you clicked on our link? Why did you search for a dentist? Um, so handling those leads, uh, we need to get out of prejudging our leads. Uh, I think that's a big, big issue with call handling is that we get into a mindset or we get into a habit of prejudging people. Um, I will never forget one of the first full arch cases that I presented with a doctor as part of a sales training. And it, to me, no teeth, you know, we call them summer teeth in that office, right? Summer here, summer there, <laughs> you know, th this patient had summer teeth and frankly didn't smell great and came in off, you know, straight from work and looked like a train wreck and just a good blue club, blue collar worker said right off the bat. Yeah. I just, I don't know if I'll be able to qualify for any financing. I don't have any credit. Uh, it's shot. And we said, well, talk to us, you know, what are you spending money on right now? That's of less importance to you than, than getting this taken care of. Well, I, I know I need to quit smoking. I got to quit drinking, you know, things that are really just destroying my life anyway. And we said, great. What are you spending on that each month? And they admitted to us that they run up a bar tab every weekend watching sports at their local sports bar of a couple hundred bucks. We said, great. So if we can find you a payment and find a way that we could help you finance that. And he goes, well, to be honest, I have a lot of money in savings. <laughs> so here he was saying it, there was no way he was going to find any financing, but just by starting a dialogue and showing interest and concern, he's like, you know what? I actually do have a lot of money that I've saved up. Let's do this. And he paid cash $25,000 down. Boom. Well, people will pay for things they find value in. So that's the most important thing. If you can create the value, they'll come up with the money. So yeah. And, and it comes back to helping them remember, why did you click the ad? Why did you search? At what point in your life are you that you're now ready to take action? What's different today than when you went and got somebody's opinion, you know, a year ago, six months ago, 12 months ago, whatever it is. Got it. No, that makes a lot of sense. So Jake, is there anything that we haven't talked about yet um, that you want to cover as we move uh, into the lightning round Q&A section? I think the biggest thing is just recognizing that the accountability measures is probably, I, I, I guess there is one thing that I would mention is what are your accountability metrics that are in place? What are your accountability measures that your marketing and your sales efforts are aligned? I think that oftentimes we, we get frustrated with our team because we're spending all this money on marketing, but we are not willing to hold them accountable. Is there a mechanism in place that's recording your phone calls? Are you leveraging AI technology to score those phone calls in order for you to know if they're being properly followed up with, that each of your leads are being contacted? Uh, that's your marketing portfolio, your lifeblood of your practice. And if you're not keeping an eye on it, then nobody is. So finding simple and quick ways that you can track the performance of your marketing all the way through to the performance of your team and in creating an environment where your team knows you'll be asking them how it's going. You'll be asking them to report back, to track their activity on those leads. That will make a huge difference where you won't have to spend more money on marketing. You'll actually find that you often spend a little bit less and get better results. Got it. All right, Jake, let's, um, let's run through some of these Q and a questions really quickly. So first question, who has been your greatest inspiration? Greatest inspirations, probably my dad, uh, in my life. He, uh, I'm number nine of 13 kids. And my mom told him when they were dating, I want 12 kids. And he's like, well, whatever it's going to take, sweetheart. And that kind of sums up who my dad is. He just, he always busted his tail, such a hard worker. Uh, he never missed a game. He was always there for me. He found a way to balance life and work. Uh, and that's just always been a crazy, powerful inspiration for me. That's awesome. Do you have a system in place to keep yourself organized? Uh, yeah, I got a lot of systems in place. Uh, one is m uh, my executive assistant, who I hired a gal that a lot of other people at the time thought she was a little bit abrasive and a little bit too aggressive for what our team needed. This was back when I worked at a different marketing agency. And I brought her with me every step of the way because she is the bulldog that I need to bark at me and tell me when I'm letting things slip. And 
So she is my organizational tool. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Who do you look for advice or membership mentorship? Ooh, um, a lot of good things. Um, you know, I, I love the, this, the verse in scripture that talks about, uh, by all good books, uh, are really what's going to help us. And so I look to the good book, uh, myself, but more importantly, I find those people that I admire and I trust. Um, and it, I've got a neighbor that I just look up to like crazy. That is such a hard worker. So humble, does incredible stuff, but you would never know it. Uh, he's just, he's just super humble and is such a hard worker. Um, and then I've got uh, my wife that is just my anchor in everything. And she keeps me, she keeps me honest and keeps me grounded and, and what needs to happen. So, uh, I look at those people closest to me as my mentors. Perfect. What mindset have helped make you successful? That's a good one. Uh, I would say the biggest mindset that's helped me stay successful is I only want to be better than the person I was yesterday. I mean, I, that's the reality. I, I don't want to be better than anybody else. I don't want to make myself feel better than anybody else. I just self-improvement is, is everything to me. And that's why the accountability is so important. Got it. Now that makes a lot of sense. What business related book has inspired you the most or what is your favorite book? The Psychology of Selling by Brian Tracy. Love that book. It, it, it keeps all sales at the simplest of terms that it all comes back to relationships and how people think. Got it. What profession do you think is the most undervalued today? Sales. I think that people look at it as a negative thing. The best advice anybody ever gave me, uh, two things. One was learn everything that you can until you're 35 and then somebody's going to cash in on you. Just be humble and learn. Put your head down and learn. And that happened for me. Uh, and then more importantly, I tell a lot of people that my degree in sales changed my entire mindset. And so I think it's very undervalued that people don't understand really what it can do. Got it. Who would you love to collaborate with and what would you love to collaborate on? I would love to collaborate with Mark Cuban on his sales processes and all the things that he has sold and becoming a self-made billionaire. I write him an email regularly. He responds. Um, he's just, uh, he, he's the type of guy that I, I love to collaborate with and I want to continue to collaborate, but at a way higher level at some point in my career. That sounds cool. That's good. I like Shark Tank too. I love Shark Tank. Um, yeah. which three adjectives describe your strength or what are three adjectives that describe your strengths? Man, I would say genuine, kind, and curious. Last question. What is one subscription, either personal or business that you can't live without? Audible. I love Audible. Perfect. So Jake, how can people reach out to you? What is the best way for them to uh, get your contact information? Yeah, goatcmo.com is our website. Uh, you're welcome to fill out a form there. Uh, our contact info is on the site. You can follow us on socials, uh, goatcmo on on uh, LinkedIn or on uh, Facebook. Uh, if you want to follow my my crazy, silly hobbies and things on, on Instagram, Jakester of all trades is my Instagram handle. Um, I love woodworking and I, you know, a lot of people, it's funny. A lot of people have actually commented on my woodworking projects when I chopped my finger off and did other things. <laughs> and so yeah, uh, reach out any, any way you want. I'd, I'd be happy to help and connect you with people. I, I love networking and meeting new people. And you want to give your email. It's Jake at goatcmo.com. Yes. Jake at GoatCMO.com. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Jake. You really uh, gave a nice, uh, a lot of good information for practice owners. So guys, if you like the episode, you want to learn more about what Jake can do for you, please reach out to Jake. He gave his his uh, email on his website, so you go check him out. If you think one of your colleagues would like the episode, please share it. Please review us. Please subscribe. The episodes come out Fridays at 5 a.m. Uh, we're going into season eight very shortly. Uh, only a few episodes left in season seven. And as I end every single one of my episodes... Remember, your reputation matters. Until the next one, Jake, thank you so much for joining me today, and we'll talk to everyone soon. Thanks, Dr. Tao.